Hello, I'm Juliet Mann and this is the Agenda podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. China's President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden have now held their first face-to-face -face meeting in a year. After the summit in San Francisco, both sides seem positive, with agreements to open new lines of communication, and Xi insisting China is not going to fight a cold war or hot war with anyone. But what does the summit really mean for global relations more widely, especially with regard to the EU's Ursula von der Leyen's visit to Beijing in December. With me now is Professor Jia Chingo from the School of International Studies at Peking University. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, how do you think that the candid and in-depth exchange between Xi and Biden altered the trajectory of US-China relations? Well, I think... Uh... This summit is very important in the sense that it, it has, uh, uh, you know, consolidated the progress uh, that has been made in terms of resuming communication and uh, consultation between the two countries at senior levels. And also, uh, it has uh, reached some uh, important uh, consensus on various kinds of issues. So, in a way, uh, China-U.S. relationship uh, is stabilized uh, for the time being and has more promise to, uh, for cooperation in the, years, uh, in the months ahead. You mentioned that stability. In fact, China's Foreign Affairs Minister Wang Yi said after the meeting that the world needs a stable China-U.S. relationship more than ever. Um, why exactly do you think now is that time? Well, uh, because, uh, uh, because of China's rise, uh, uh, the relationship involves not just one superpower, but also a forthcoming one. Uh, so the two countries have a lot of weight uh, in uh, international relations, uh, in influencing uh, world events. So if they can stabilize their relationship, if they can cooperate, then uh, a lot of problems in the world uh, have a chance to get resolved and effectively managed. He, he also questioned whether China and the US were, were partners or rivals. What do you make of that statement? We are partners in the sense that we share a lot of uh, uh, common interests and stakes in our bilateral relationship uh, we have a lot of trade, we have a lot of investment in each other's country. We also uh, share a lot of uh, uh, interest in terms of security, and also uh, uh, we, we share a lot of aspirations as to how to deal with uh, the global challenges, uh, ranging from proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, illegal immigration, and terrorism and, and climate change. So uh, uh, we should work together. In that sense, uh, we are partners. Of course, we have a lot of conflicts. We have a lot of differences. We need to manage those differences and uh, make sure that they, not, they do not veer us into a conflict, especially a military conflict. And, of course, there was lots of discussion about the, the five pillars approach, including changes in perception and, and managing disagreements effectively, as you've just mentioned. So which of the pillars do you think needs most work and why? Well, I think they are all very important. I think, uh, first of all, a correct understanding of the nature of the relationship. <laughs> That's very important. I think a lot of people... Uh, uh, tend to view one aspect of the relationship at a time, uh, but uh, the relationship has to be viewed as a whole. Uh, it it ha involves uh, both the uh, shared stakes and interests and also conflict, conflicts and differences. So, uh, but uh, our shared interests and stakes uh, far outweigh uh, the need uh, to... Uh, fight uh, and, and, uh, and uh, over the differences. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, 
the 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 basis for us to uh, uh, to develop our relationship. But of course, other aspects of the pillars are also very important. Let's talk a little bit more about those disagreements, because President Xi said it's important to both appreciate each other's principles but also red lines and refrain from flip-flopping and being provocative and crossing the lines. What's your take on that? Well, we have a lot of differences in terms of uh, ideology, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, to what extent you, you can interfere in other countries' internal affairs. Uh, and also we have uh, uh, you know, different views as to what constitutes uh, freedom of navigation. Uh, from the U.S. point of view, uh, as long as uh, it's uh, beyond the territorial waters, then uh, you can have freedom uh, of navigation. Uh, you can send your military ships, spy sh uh, planes, uh, very close to your coast, but it's in international orders. But in, from the Chinese perspective, uh, you know, you can have free commercial uh, navigation, but then if you, uh, you can have safe passage uh, uh, of military uh, uh, ships and uh, aircrafts. But if you conduct uh, military activities and conduct uh, spy missions, then, uh, you know, that's not uh, 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 totally free. Uh, <laughs> somehow you have to, you, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, so we have differences over that too. And also, uh, most importantly, uh, you know, the, the, the question of Taiwan, you know, to what extent the U.S. has the right uh, to uh, uh, tell us uh, Chinese uh, what to do with uh, Taiwan, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, what are the rights uh, mm. uh, Chinese have uh, over Taiwan. Uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, Taiwan is part of our country, uh, even though it's uh, uh, politically separate at the moment. Uh, it's still uh, territorially uh, part of China in, in, in sovereignty terms. So uh, the U.S. has no right to sell arms to Taiwan, and the uh, U.S. has no right to send military personnel to train the Taiwan uh, uh, military forces in, uh, on the island. So, uh, so somehow, uh, you know, uh, these and uh, many other differences we have, uh, we need to manage those differences to make sure that we do not get into a military conflict over those differences. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, on human rights, we have different conceptions as to uh, how to protect uh, human rights, uh, individual rights vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the collective rights. Yeah. So uh, somehow we need to uh, respect each other in terms of their domestic governance uh, uh, on the human rights issue. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, you yeah. have a right to, uh, to, to criticize uh, each other, uh, but, uh, but then uh, such criticism should not, uh, should be, uh, should not be made uh, as a kind of propaganda yeah. against the other party. So uh, uh, we need uh, dialogue and exchanges of views uh, 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 even on that kind of uh, uh, differences. So there's an acute acknowledgement of, of the differences, but President Xi was very clear that he wants to build more bridges and pave more roads for people-to-people -people interactions. But what might that look like in practice? Well, uh, there are many things to be done, uh, especially at the people-to-people -people, uh, uh, exchanges uh, level. Uh, you know, we can make... a uh, uh, you know, getting a visa easier. <laughs> we can uh, 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 try to increase the, the number of flights so as to drive down the, the cost of travel. And also, uh, we can uh, encourage more people to visit each other, to study, to do business, yeah. to uh, you know, visit their relatives, to do sightseeing. So all these kinds of things, uh, the two governments uh, should make efforts to uh, make it easier for pe uh, and, and, and um, less expensive uh, for, for this uh, kind of activity to uh, happen. Now China's next key meeting with Western powers is likely to be in December. That's a high-level delegation, including 
EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is planning to go to, to Beijing. How might the meeting that we've had in San Francisco affect all of that? I think it will have a positive impact on uh, exchanges between China and uh, e uh, EU. Uh, 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 one of the obstacles in the past is uh, uh, the, you know, uh, problematic relationship between China and the U.S. The U.S. tend to uh, uh, would ask the, their uh, uh, allies and partners, uh, you know, to 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 toe the line, uh, to stand on the U.S. side. And now the U.S. China uh, is trying to uh, work with China uh, to stabilize the relationship. So probably uh, opens up more room for uh, EU and US uh, uh, allies and partners uh, to uh, do the same. So, uh, uh, but of course, uh, EU has its own priorities, uh, its own mm. uh, challenges. Uh, it wants to deal with uh, China on its own uh, terms. Uh, but uh, uh, one problem less <laughs> probably <laughs> would help. Where do you see relations between the, the, the three global powers, China, the United States and Europe, sitting by the end of the year? The previous uh, slide toward deterioration, toward a worse relationship, uh, is, uh, has been effectively put to a stop uh, for the time being. Uh, and uh, uh, so there is more room uh, for the three parties to engage with each other and identify, uh, you know, manage their differences, identify areas where uh, their interests uh, overlap or uh, they shared uh, common interests and stakes, and work uh, uh, together on the uh, on, on that basis uh, to achieve uh, 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 their goals. Uh, for example, work cooperation on the climate change, cooperation on um, uh, you know, uh, 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 other uh, global uh, problems, uh, uh, whether uh, immigration, uh, Im illegal immigration, or terrorism, or or drug smuggling, or money laundering. So uh, there are all kinds of things that that uh, uh, the the three parties can uh, have shared interests, and they should work together. And, and at the, by the end of the year, I think they have a better chance than earlier uh, to deal with the, to engage in such kind of cooperation. Professor Jia Chingo, thank you very much. Thank you. As we've heard, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen will be heading to Beijing in December, along with the President of the European Council, Charles Michel. So what impact might the summit in San Francisco have on that gathering? Joining me now from Brussels are Bernard De Witt, Chair of the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and Hosuk Limakiyama, Director of the European Centre for International Political Economy. Thanks for coming on the agenda, gentlemen. Bernard, I'm going to start with you. I, I wonder if the agenda for the EU meeting in December is likely to be much different from the issues we've already been hearing discussed this week between President Xi and President Biden. Well, there will be common issues and different uh, issues. The common issues are uh, two uh, aspects. Uh, some are the conflicting issues common to the EU and the US in dealing with China, the trade deficit, the de-risking, the open access to Chinese market. The positive common issues are the fight for climate change, uh, the pollution, the biodiversity, also the interdependence. Uh, people speak of China America. We could speak of China Europe uh, interdependence. And the different uh, issues is specific, for instance, to the U.S. Uh, is the military issue, mm. the crisis of fentanyl, which is less uh, affecting uh, Europe. Uh, and specifically to Europe is the inquiry, for instance, on uh, Chinese electric vehicles, the screening procedure, 
the uh, famous uh, uh, words, uh, um, China being partner, uh, competitor and systemic rival, uh, as mentioned uh, Mr. Breton uh, during his trip in China very recently. Also, the, the mood music from San Francisco um, suggests an improvement in relations between China and the United States. How does that benefit Europe, do you think? Well, um, the Europe's, re Europe's relationship with China is very often seen as a function of the relationship uh, between the United States and China, uh, meaning that you need to have good relationship between Washington and Beijing in order to also have any kind of progress on the European dossier. Uh, it could actually play out in two different ways because we have to also remember that in many areas, uh, United States and China uh, and Europe forms a rivalry in terms of commercial interests. So, for example, if you look at uh, the question about civil aircrafts, United States improving its position vis-a-vis -vis China could actually lead to some advantages for Boeing, which has been rumored for several weeks now. And that could, of course, have a very detrimental impact on sales of Airbus in, um, in China. We have to remember that the United States and Europe are actually their worst commercial rivals still. So that certainly plays into it. So, Bernard, let me ask you, for, from an investor point of view, because many analysts are looking at San Francisco as in a bit of an inflection point to lure investors back into China. So I wonder if a trade detente between China and the US is good news for Europe. I think it is good news. I think it is good news because that will allow um, European companies uh, to go with more confidence uh, uh, to, to China. I must say that uh, many, uh, especially of the big European companies, uh, have long been in China and are still staying in China and are still investing in, in China. Uh, we, we saw, uh, uh, for instance, uh, BASF, uh, uh, who made a very big investment very recently. Uh, but it can uh, attract uh, new, especially small and medium-sized companies back to China uh, without uh, uh, too much uh, fear of uh, retaliation uh, from the US, for instance. Uh, that is something we can hope. Hossuk, how linked do you think the EU and the United States are now in terms of the, the relationship they, they have with, with China? I mean, might the EU want to be seen as treading its own path and not just following the lead of the United States? I would say it depends on what you mean by Europe. I mean, obviously, France and Germany have their own um, security as well as commercial interests, which are distinctly different from the line that the United States may or may not be advocating. And uh, at the same time, we have a common interest uh, as EU, uh, where Brussels is actually getting cloud as its own security and foreign policy voice. And what we have seen in the last few months, perhaps, is that there is a particular close relationship between President Joe Biden and the European Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, where they seem to be at least in very good sync in terms of what they actually want from China and how they see the end game further down the road as China become a much stronger power. So I think uh, the best way to answer this question is to say that, yes, United States and Europe play along in certain areas, but there are also uh, there are areas where each European member state have their own interest vis-a-vis -vis not just, well, United States, but also against each other. Hossuk, let me stay with you. I wonder if you think China views Europe as a competitor, and, and if so, in which industries in particular? Well, uh, in some of the most um, advanced sectors with the highest value added, we have started to see a head-on competition between Europe and China. I'm thinking um, in areas like network infrastructure, Huawei has certainly taken significant share of not just European markets, but also third markets um, away from uh, European dominant players like Nokia and Ericsson. 
And this has also culminated in a number of politically sensitive conflicts and including a number of uh, measures that have been taken both China and Europe against each other. But also in areas like in energy, infrastructure, electrical grid, we have seen now that China is making forays uh, into um, uh, notably Southeast Asia and other third markets where Chinese interests have become really, really strong and actually a viable alternative to European construction engineering companies. Let's talk a little bit more about technology. But now I want to pick up on something that you mentioned before um, about uh, the comments that European Commissioner Tiahing Bireton made on his recent trip to Beijing, making a bit of a jibe at China's tough line on access to its vast telecoms market. And he noted that the European 5G equipment provider's share has fallen to single digits. So what do you expect then in terms of that access to the Chinese market for European companies? Well, as uh, Commissioner Breton uh, mentioned uh, in, a, in a speech he made uh, in Beijing during his last trip, um, I, I would say the, the challenge for, for Europe uh, is uh, uh, he, we, the European authorities uh, want to have a rebalance of the relationship uh, between uh, uh, China and Europe, uh, the fact that there is a, a very important trade deficit, uh, the de-risking of the economies, uh, the addressing uh, cha global challenges together. Concerning the telecom uh, sector, uh, there is uh, indeed uh, um, the Chinese companies uh, have uh, taken the lead, and I, I must say that is also due to the fact that um, the investments uh, in research and development by companies like uh, uh, Huawei, for instance, is uh, enormous, um, and that has brought uh, uh, such companies uh, to be very advanced. But uh, there are uh, also European uh, uh, telecom providers like, for instance, uh, Nokia or Ericsson, uh, who would like to have uh, some uh, uh, part uh, uh, of the market uh, also in China in providing some um, installations uh, in uh, China. And, um, that is uh, all the questions of uh, uh, the um, openness of the market, of the public procurement uh, market uh, to be more open. I must say that uh, the uh, declaration of the Chinese authorities re relatively recently, especially from the MOFCOM, uh, is positive in that aspect. Uh, uh, China mentioned they want to open more uh, their market. I think that is a good sign and uh, which shows uh, some new opportunities for the European companies in that field. And Hossuk, where do you see um, scope for close collaboration with the European Union and that bridge building that President Xi spoke about with Joe Biden? I mean, AI, EVs, critical minerals, where are we going to see those partnerships forming? Well, before we can talk of any partnership, I think we need to have a reset where we actually acknowledge each other as speaking partners. And the way that the dialogue has been going over sanctions, but also some trade disputes, in notably the EV one that you mentioned, but also the, uh, the number of actions that have been taken against uh, Chinese infrastructure companies like Huawei, uh, we probably are at a position where nobody is really interested in giving up. And we are also um, nearing European elections, which makes it a very close option at hand to just wait until you have a new uh, parliament in Brussels coming in, and which would allow you um, to actually do a reset without going back in any of the previous positions that has been taken. But there are some low-hanging fruits that has been discussed over the years, and uh, not least in areas like um, not so glamorous, perhaps, but relatively technical dossiers like food safety standards or um, intellectual property, where China and Europe have some common problems and could work towards a common interest. Uh, so it takes a lot before we actually start to talk about big issues like electrical vehicles or critical raw materials, where, because there is an inherent interest on both sides to keep on to that leverage as long as they can. 
Uh, and Bernard, I wonder if you, you can pile into this, because there have been curbs in the United States and Europe of Chinese investment into critical technologies. And I wonder if you think that there's going to be more or, or less scrutiny now that the United States and China uh, seem to be on steadier footing. I do not expect much changes uh, in the near future. Uh, I think, uh, uh, especially uh, at European level, uh, uh, there have been uh, some uh, measures taken, and I don't see them uh, uh, taking back, for instance, uh, the, the screening procedures uh, that uh, are affecting uh, all non-EU investments. So that means not only Chinese investments in Europe, but also, uh, for instance, US investments. Um, that will remain. Um, the point will be to see uh, how it will be, um, how will be the implementation. Because you have to know that uh, screening procedure, for instance, is a measure taken at EU level for all European countries, but each European country uh, has to implement it. And that means that some countries could uh, implement it more stronger than others. So we'll have to see uh, in the two following years uh, how will be the implementation uh, at that level. So I do not expect much uh, difference for the moment. The difference will be for them in the atmosphere. The mm. atmosphere, if there is a, a release uh, of the US-China tensions, the atmosphere will be more open, uh, more smooth uh, for later. But immediately, I do not expect uh, much changes. And Hosuk, where do you see the relationship between the EU and China settling by the end of this year? And I suppose I want to also know where your expectations are in terms of ties developing into 2024. Well, I think in the short term, we can't expect much firework, I'm afraid. Uh, just to keep things uh, as they are, um, agreeing to a ratchet that, not, that would basically bind both parties to not to deteriorate the relationship even further. Even that would be a major win at this stage. And Bernard, the same question to you. What's your take? I think first, the fact that the summit takes place is something very positive. Dialogue is continuing. Dialogue uh, is bringing uh, some uh, common project. Um, I think one of the challenges will be also, for instance, to uh, have again uh, more cooperation between our universities, European and Chinese universities, because um, that is also the future. The future generations will be... Yeah. Um, now uh, pushed for further to know each other better. Uh, I think that is one of the challenges, and I hope uh, there will be some progress at that level following uh, the end of the COVID crisis and the closing of the borders. Bernard de Witt, Hosek Nakiyama, thank you very much. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world. Can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.